Thank you very much, Miguel. My name is, um, as Miguel said, is Bettina schulz paulson I'm from the University of Gothenburg. I'm an archaeologist. And I would like to thank Miguel and Anna, most of all, to invite me here to give this talk. This is wonderful. You brought me here on this beautiful place, and I have the opportunity to meet my old colleagues also. And uh, I would like to present my ERC, EU ERC Starting Grant Project, NEOC, and um, uh, on the emergence of megaliths and megalithic societies in Europe and they're spreading over the seaway. And um, yes, it's a long, old, long-lasting question where megaliths emerged in Europe and where me megalithic societies emerged in Europe. With megaliths, I mean megalithic tombs, standing stones, but also megalithic buildings. And it's also the questions uh, why Neolithic societies, Stone Age societies built megaliths. And uh, this photo is one of my favorites. It shows my son on the Orkney Islands when he was 11. And he was asking, Mom, what is this? And this is what I was asking me since decades, actually since I was a student. This is a question was was very much fascinating me. And uh, this is why I tried for my PhD to compile uh, information, literature, uh, and most of all, C14 dates on the megaliths in Europe, as well, I tried to compile this, but it took me de facto much longer than a PhD time. I was maybe working 10 years on the database for this, because before my work, uh, quite much was spread all around the countries in different literature, in different languages, so I was struggling a lot with uh, literature in different languages. And um, it's said today there's still 35,000 remaining, but they're actually much more. What we see now also when I start to compile them more. And I try to analyze the C14 dates. Uh, this were 2,400 at this time with the Bayesian statistical framework to see how megaliths emerged. And I had luck I could publish this in PNAS, in an American journal. And this is what I was uh, coming um, out with 2019, uh, what I could reconstruct on the basement of this C14 dates at this time. And it looks like uh, the red period, uh, as I said, I call it the red period between 4,700 and 4,000 that megaliths emerged in Northwest France because here I had the most uh, earliest possible onset of data, but also transitional stages to the megaliths. And then I could follow within this time period that you have something like uh, regions where megaliths are emerging as non-accessible small dolmens, like I called them. And I had partly uh, regions where I had directly radiocom dates, but I had also regions where we only had the cultural material and associated radiocom dates. Also, I tried to narrow down this as much as possible. And um, the green phase is between 4,000 and 3,500. It's what I call also the time when the, the passage graves are spreading, because then you see thousands of passage graves are along the Atlantic facet built and I have quite short data there also, sh short time intervals. It starts later in the Norway country, like in the Funnel Beaker area, between 3,500 and 3,000 and later with a megalithic revival. Also we have in orange uh, in the Mediterranean, but there we have, of course, also uh, early megalithic regions like uh, Jean Guillaume was already showing on Sardinia and Corsica and so on. Yes, and uh, what am I doing at the moment in my new C project? Because um, I had a lot of problems while COVID, while the pandemic, it was difficult to collect samples, it was difficult to establish connections, uh, collaborations, and also to start field work. And this is what I'm doing at the moment. I can maybe show you. I have three different excavation projects one more time. 
One here now on the west coast of Sweden, an early megalith on the, on the island of Orust. One in Tuscany started, uh, it's a megalithic necropolis, Val di Lorio. Then um, I have had an excavation on the Ile Dieu with a French colleague from the University of Nantes. I have different regions, like here in Lisbon, for example, where I work together with museums and archives for sample material for human bones. New here also for Tavatet, where I was here in April meeting Miguel and his team and Anna. And um, I have a project on the Monte da Cori on Sardinia <coughs> in San Benedetto, Hypogea. Then I have a collaboration with Ustica, with Claudia Speciale, a very early megalithic grave on an island in the Mediterranean with very early date. And uh, what I will talk later more about, mostly here in the Morbihan, uh, on environmental DNA, but it's also a dating program, as well I try to retrieve sample material for <coughs> C14 dates. And here, as a, beside that, I had this excavation on the Ile Dieu. I'm working together here with contract archaeology because this showed to be a very good strategy. Uh, and I'm partly also going on these excavations and taking samples myself. Okay, and what, what am I doing in this new C project? I have five sub-projects. The first, with the first I want to refine my chronology uh, <coughs> and I want to aim to produce 600 radiocarbon dates to go deeper. The second is really focused on ancient DNA, ancient DNA analysis, and it is a collaboration together with geogenetics in Copenhagen. And we are producing um, full genomes. Full genomes also try to produce, and that means you get 3 million markers for an individual. Uh, so you can see not only the genetic mixture, not only the family ties, but also things like the pathogens or uh, phenotypes, you can say a lot of things with these uh, results we get. Then we have a sub-project which is really focused on the environmental DNA and this means we're retrieving DNA from sediments from Earth. And uh, if it's successful, you can say really much, you can say the fauna, you can say all the plants, you can say all the parasites, animals, humans who have been on this, you can really uh, say on a little handful of earth, as I think this is quite fascinating, I still don't understand how this is working, but it seems to work. Then a sub-project for modeling seaways with agent-based modeling. And uh, then I'm working also much with rock art, rock art documentations for sub-project five. Okay, and uh, and um, yes, um, the project is uh, 72 months, six years. We had one year of extension because of COVID. I have four postdocs, as I got three at the moment. Uh, fourth one will be employed to do the seafaring modeling. And um, I have been employing Rita Perotera Sterna, Audrey Blanchard, and <coughs> also Youth McCall, who is a biostatistician, who is analyzing the DNA results. And then uh, I got a really great team and also senior researchers who are supporting this. Plus, I'm part of a synergy grant, COREX, from Stephen Shannon, Christian Christiansen, Kurt Kier, Mark Thomas, uh, where there's a couple of researchers modeling, so I can use the infrastructure there to model my results. So this is how I'm organized. Okay, but before I'm talking about the Morbihan, I would like to show you a bit about the other projects, and this is the latest in May, our, our excavation project on the Swedish west coast, Tengneby. It's a dolmen, it's one of the earliest dolmen, and I was searching for a project of dolmen which was at the former sea shore, because uh, we have in Scandinavia the opposite problem, like for example in Brittany, we have a land lift, so the coastline is not the same like it was today. And it is the first excavation on this island since over 100 years. And uh, I'll have to show this quick. I was heavily inspired by Miguel and his team and the, the excavation photos you showed me because I wanted to have exactly such a trench like you did there in Tavatet. So. <laughs> So I will do the quarters later in the next years, but we wanted to have the whole profile. 
before we excavate the chamber then. Okay, and uh, as I said, it's an early megalithic round dolmen, and we're expecting C14 dates around 3,500. Then um, we found several for the West Coast unknown features, like we had post holes in the tumulus. And um, we, could, we saw here, like around there is like a pavement of stones. We have non local stones, which seems like planted. And um, yes, you see on the bottom, you see the, you see the former beach. So this is really the border where we have. Then on the upper, upper trench, we found even two Mesolithic layers, also Mesolithic settlements. So it was all in one square meters. We had really a luck. And now uh, the goal here is really to reconstruct the marine megalithic, and, but also the pre-megalithic environment. So we're taking quite much sediment samples like uh, phytolites, pollen, Macores, but mostly environmental DNA to go really new paths because this is also a region where we have no bone material. And we heard today a couple of times from regions how difficult it is if you can't date bones. So what are we doing with uh, megaliths where we have only sediments? So I'm doing a lot of research there. But what is also at least as important is really a collaboration exchange European because my French colleagues, Audrey Blanchard, uh, Jean-Noël Guillaudot, they came and excavated with me. And we have a little bit of vision. We want that people are exchanging, that uh, megalit experts traveling around, exchanging, excavating with each other, so that we really can <coughs> combine our knowledge and also our skills. So I have been excavating with them, they're excavating with me. Okay, this is Sweden. Then we have the megaliths in the Mediterranean Sea, where I work with my colleague Maria Grazia Melis from the University of Sassari on the Neolithic Pyramid in Monte da Codi. And we are um, on the way to produce uh, many C14 dates, really to establish a highly precise chronology. The goal is 100. We have fauna material, we have bone material from animals. But it's interesting also between them we find human bones, so at the moment, like for example, this mandibula from a senil woman, like it seems, it was found on the Monte da Cody itself. So here we're looking if we can get some DNA out and we will date it. Then up you see Limuri uh, as Jean um, Guillain presented and I'm desperately since two, three years searching for the bone material. And I had an anthropologist, she went through all the archives. We can't find it, so we hope for a happy end at the end then, maybe, yes. But it's difficult because this material from old excavations is all around and uh, has been replaced and packed down, unpacked, and yes. Then uh, we have a hypogea, Geum San Benedetto, Iglesias, Sardinia. It's uh, Osieri culture, what we think may be, uh, estimated date 4,200 uh, to 3,700, we think. In this, hypogee is very, uh, the bone material is very well preserved, and there were 42 individuals. It said we could sample 19. I sample very conservative, as we have been just taking samples from, for example, a loose pass petrosa or loose teeth. I'm not going on full skulls if it's not necessary. And we had really luck, and this was really surprising, because this material looked not good, as it looked good, but not for DNA. And from the 19 sampled, 15 yielded ancient DNA, as we just had uh, these results back last week. And we have nine full genomes, and this is really nice. So this is great, because I hope really with this analysis we can say a lot. And then, then we do multi-proxy analysis also with isotopic. We do the, the, the N15, C13, of course, but also sulfur and oxygen, uh, which is new, which we are doing now for this. Okay, and then we have a very nice project, megaliths in the Mediterranean, Tyrrhenian Sea, in Tuscany, in the Maremma, on the Monte Leone. And uh, this is a, a new site discovered 2020 from the Caribbeanieri de la Forestieri, it's called. They were looking for historical paths and found on this hill many walls, but also graves. 
And we hope, we think, is this what John Gillet calls uh, tombe a cercle, tombe a circoli, because uh, uh, they're looking like this from the uh, architecture, what we see now, plus they have uh, all, every tomb has one two or two, up to three standing stones associated. And um, we had a field campaign last year, and it's a very dense forest. Most of all, we wanted to do the LiDAR drone, wanted to drive the LiDAR drone, but it seems to be difficult because it was just the necropolis was just beside the military. And we had a lot of forth and back. And in the end, the colonel came up with, his, with some of his soldiers, and we tried to convince him that it's really important that they let us do it. And in the end, he said, he had a cigar, and he said, okay, you can fly, but come not closer than 30 meters to my, our camp, or we shoot you down. <laughs> but we were allowed to fly in the end. And um, yes, here you see this, this is on a, it's an area, it's amazing, and the forest is on 100 hectares. We have 27 kilometers walls, thick walls, all kind of structures. And we have this necropole, and they could, uh, ocularly, they could uh, say, as they found around 20 tombs. And yes, you see here all the walls, which over a couple of years from uh, the Paolo Nanina, he's called from the superintendent, he went there many years to uh, document these wall structures. And uh, this is the LiDAR result. We, try, we were driving a LiDAR drone metric 300 with um, a unit of 160 kh sting and with a triple return and we were flying 50 meters high and had a resolution of about two centimeters per pixel and what you see here here's a little bit with a different light and with a different light And in the end, we could um, define, we found 42 tombs all together and structures with ditches, which are really strange because they're laying under the tombs partly. And this is something we will work on in the next year. So, so next April, we have a new campaign there where we really um, want to excavate one of these graves. We started already a bit with one, but very careful. Here we were uh, working around the standing stones here trench at the corner, here on the side, but we had not good C14 dates. We had a lot of recent C14 dates because of a fire, and we started to excavate in what we thought it's a central structure that could be the grave, and there was a standing stone and something like a secondary burial uh, with a late Bronze Age date. But next time we really want to excavate the whole profile and look, and we're hoping for Neolithic dates. Okay, this was the Monte Leone. Then I have Portugal, uh, where I was working much with the Museum Geological Lisbon, and I was working with the material Rui Boaventura, which was an estimated colleague of mine and also of other people here who died much too early, unfortunately, continued with his phone material. Then uh, I had also one of my postdocs, Rita Perotera Juana. She was uh, in the Sintra region. She was uh, compiling bone material. So we have human bone samples from 160 and uh, 64 individuals, which it's one Mesolithic graveyard, 11 megalithic graves, and three caves. See here in the in the Sintra region. Here is the first 42 C14 dates I had back from uh, 100 more are in the laboratory at the moment. But uh, when I did my, uh, as of before this project, there was 89 uh, radiocarbon dates from human bones from uh, Portugal. And I think we can triple this now. And I think already this will give a lot. And from 50 individuals, we had DNA, ancient DNA. So this is a really uh, interesting, and I can't just tell you the results which I had last week. I can't tell too much yet, but it will make some people happy here, and you will understand in a couple of months why I tell this. Okay, and then, and last but not least, I want to mention Algarve and Monchique Mountains. This is where the travel started, where I helped. I was allowed to assist 
Antonio with the excavations with I had some students with and this was very interesting for me to excavate this but as as we said it is also a region where we have no bone material and we have to find new ways there Okay, and these new ways I'm trying now uh, in France uh, with the Environmental DNA Project and the emergence of megaliths and megalithic societies in Europe and in Northwest France. And I'm very interested in these early megalithic uh, <coughs> horizons. And to these early megalithic horizons are belonging this big standing stone like the Grand Men here which you know was 330 tons and 24 meters long and was transported, it said, 12 kilometers from the Van region. Then we have these uh, monumental graves. Here is the last phase of the Saint-Michel, which started like Luc also showed, uh, uh, and showed nicely. It started much more modest in the first phase, but also within this time horizon. But also here, we have really the problem, we have no bone material. We have the bone material for the, mega, uh, for the Mesolithic graveyards on the Eilig, on Hödig and Tevig. But for these earliest megalithic horizons, we have no bone material, so we can't really date these graves, or we cannot say too much about these societies. Then they're also connected to long distance trade. We all know the jadeite axes, we all know where they're coming from. Then the Calais project who showed that uh, really a part of this uh, beads also are coming from the Iberian Peninsula, from Velva. Then what is also important uh, is the megalithic seascape. We have the depictions of whales on standing stones, like you see here. But also new identified from Serge Cassin, the giant squids which is also very interesting. And if you don't believe me, I was showing these engravings yesterday. I was in La Rochelle at the marine department and showing this uh, to uh, specialists in marine fauna. And they said, for example, about these squids, they said they could not make it better. They said it was really excellent depicted from these Neolithic societies, uh, this, the squids. Also they, they said it's really convincing. Then uh, we also have in this region, it's the only regions where we have boats depicted. Here's just one sort, one kind of these boats, also they're very simple with the crew strokes, but there's different kind of boats depicted in the megalithic graves in the Morbihan. Ah. Yes, and um, I want to talk also in this connection again with, uh, uh, on the stone alignments of Kanak and the Luplasco site, which Luc already mentioned, because this is new. This is one of the collaborations I did with uh, Contract Archaeology and a dating program. And uh, you all know the alignments of Kanak and also that this phenomena is very much restricted to this region to the Bay of Morbihan, to the Kanak, Erdeven region, is only there in the whole of Europe where we find this kind of stone rows so concentrated, uh, over 3,000 up to 7 meters high, and uh, really much researched since the 18th century. But also very enigmatic because there's a lot of legends and discussions and debates on the significance of Kanak. And it's not really consensus because there's so many theories about it as researchers who are working with it, what they could represent. And what is especially interesting to me is the age. And this is really difficult. Uh, it's, you can nearly say, unknown, because it's very difficult to date standing stones. Normally it's done with charcoal, you find in the context surrounding, but you never know, does this charcoal has to do with the erection of the stone? Or what are you dating there, actually? Then also tries with OSL, that is giving a very large uh, standard deviation marginal, so it's all not really satisfying to date standing stones. And this is why this project was so interesting for me, because my colleague, she excavated, which I think, also think is a part of this alignments of Kanak, with standing stones, the remains of standing stones, cooking pits, but also very early grave, like you will see soon. 
And where you see the star, there, there is the Leplaska site inside the... Sorry, I can't let it. I can't. Here, and then you see red, these are the alignments of the So you see where the, where the, uh, the site is laying within. So it, it seems to be a part of this really Karnak complex. Here is a, a density map with the sites, with the Neolithic sites in the Bay of the Morbihan, also where you see the Le Plasker site, Blue Anel. And in this site we had a grave, a pre-megalithic but monumental tomb. It is a chist inside with dry wall and it was covered by a tumulus. You could see, see the remains of a tumulus. Then we had just beside fundaments of standing stones and they are partly have the same diameter with the ones in Loc Maria Quer. It's difficult to reconstruct the size of the standing stone, but they could have been really large. And we got cooking pits in combination with this, and partly they're even aligned to a, as a, to a alignment uh, that you have cooking pits with uh, the fundaments of the standing stones. So uh, what did we do here? Uh, it was really a large dating program with 49, see 14 dates from 33 sites, uh, features. And we uh, took short-lived samples, hazel or sapwood of oaks. And I was in the beginning, I was thinking this will not work. But in the end, it was giving a very homogeneous, as a very short-faced picture, which is really nice. And um, yes. I was applying a Bayesian statistical framework and we could uh, date the grave to uh, 4,790, between 4,790 and 4,670, as so around 4,700, <laughs> very early, but as I said, this is not yet a megalith, so it's on the way to become into the megaliths as a pre-megalithic phase, but an important phase. And uh, you see here uh, the different phases. So we had two Mesolithic phases. And one was, by the way, look, also one of the features you showed. But it seems to be that this was a Mesol Mesolithic hut because we had clear Mesolithic uh, C14 dates to it. Then we have this mound with the grave. And then we have the first clear alignment phase. And this alignment phase is between 4,670 and 4,370. Within this 300 years, we have several subphases. We can follow, we could reconstruct with G quadrat tests, we could reconstruct alignments, we could look if the stones were together, not only um, ocular, not only what we saw or thought it was an alignment, also over the C14 dates. So within these 300 years, it seems there have been several uh, standing stones erected, uh, formed to alignments together with these cooking pits also. It is a cooking pit alignment phase. Then we have a little bit later, a hundred year lasting later phase, which was clear um, beside, and then also some last hertz. But this main alignment phase is between 4,670 and 4,370, which is a very nice result. I think it's the first time we really can narrow down a bit on date this uh, C14, also this, um, so it is working to date standing stones over charcoal. You just have to do it in the right way, it seems. Or select, or do a lot of C14 dates and, and, and select them carefully and also have a lot of luck. That, yeah. Okay, but what did we do more? We had this nice result for the grave and then I wanted to do with the uh, court care and um, the, um, the Copenhagen team, we did environmental DNA sampling and we had three in the megalithic grave chamber. You need to take control samples to see if you're really on the right track. And we took also in the ditch, we took some and we wanted to reconstruct the full environment, but also I wanted to trace the human DNA. This was my goal. Yes, on the results so far, what I can tell you is you get a lot of bacteria. We had around 16,000 reads. 
You got a lot of fungi, but only 187. You have viridu planted, it means all different uh, fauna. And uh, the metasoons are especially interesting for me, as this is all animals, and especially for me, the marine reeds. And there we had 34 different fish species. For cephalopoda, that means squids, octopus, nautilus is something you would never find in an archaeological record normally. Melacostre, you would also not, the crustaceans like Homer, you would also not find normally in the archaeological record. And we had altogether 26 mammals. Uh, one is pinniped. We had no whale yet. So, yes, but it's very interesting, um, the results. And they're also very new. We just had them quite recently. And we had Homo in the grave. And the nice thing is, it's fragmented. That means it's ancient, it's old. So my biostatistician is working with it. And look what we found, if it's Neolithic DNA, if it is Mesolithic, if it's a mixture, what we can say about it. So I'm really, really happy for this result, I can tell you. And if this is working, we can maybe adapt this for other regions too. Then what am I doing more? Because it's such a pioneer study, we had 40 sites all over Europe in Corex. Some sites were re really well working, some not. But it seems Pluanel was really good working, good preservation, but also because it was a tomb, it was closed. And you have a very well preservation also in caves, for example, or submerged sites. I do different stuff also to support this. I do now the cooking pits, we're taking more environmental DNA in the cooking pits because I really want to find whale blubber. This is really my dream. I want to find, um, yes, something like this, but also really reconstruct the kitchen, the, the megalithic kitchen. And for this, we are also taking samples for phytoliths. Then York is doing lipid residue analysis to trace in the sediments and on the stones for the fats and what kind of lipids we have. Then we want to do starch grain analysis on the meal stones. This is Claudia Speziale doing. Then uh, compare all the reeds with bone assemblages from archaeological remains, from excavation reports. These are my French colleagues doing. And then tracing for extinct species. This is why I was in La Rochelle yesterday to do a collaboration with the marine department so they can, they can go through the reeds and look, is this possible or not. And then, of course, also comparing it with today reads from the Breton Sea. And this is a collaboration with Cherno, the Marine Science Center. Then here to the Ilieu, where I did uh, excavation a short, I was choosing this site because it's on an island. So it's really fitting to my Neo Sea team. It was already in the Neolithic an island. It was very dense, populated, and they found sperm whale teeth in this grave. Uh, in the excavations uh, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. So we could even find one again in a small museum. The rest is lost. As also, and it is the only grave where we really had human bones there, and this is why I was choosing it. And I thought it's an easy thing. I go to the archive or to the museum. We will have the bone material. I can date it, do DNA, but the bone material was lost. And uh, it's most probably like this, that they were thrown in the 60s together with mummies and uh, medieval material and buried in the, in the public cemetery because they wanted to have space in the, in the archive. So this was a really dark day when I heard this, but we had the, uh, the whale teeth and we found by the excavation 20 human bones, also 20 teeth. And we took a lot of sediments also for environmental DNA this is how you look if you do it. In the beginning I was assisting, today I'm doing it myself. And uh, uh, there we had also nice reeds with the plants, but we got problems with the C14. We had over 30 C14 dates, human bones, teeth, but the most is late Neolithic, Balbic or Iron Age. So it's a really disturbed grave, it's such a pity. So we're still hoping for the last round of C14 dates that they're getting us, the middle Neolithic dating which the architecture would uh, assume that it is. Okay, and this is the last site. Um, which is Air Hastel, it's a settlement close in Loch Maria Kea, close to the um, pigmen here, to the, to the site of the Table de Marchand. 
seems to be also recent Neolithic between 4,200 and 3,800. It's the first time such a large settlement is excavated in the Morbihan. And uh, there is houses and a lot of cooking pits. And you see me here uh, sampling for environmental DNA as we're trying here really with the experience I gained from Blue Anel, we're trying really the whole program with the cooking pits and reconstructing, uh, reconstructing the uh, megalithic environment. Okay, what can I say so far? Also, you see it's just the status quo. In a couple of months, I can say much more. Also, results, the sampling is almost completed and we're doing the analysis. And uh, this uh, EU-founded fieldwork and sampling program will give us, maybe in the next two, two years, really um, uh, assist in understanding the emergence of megaliths and megalithic societies in Europe, hopefully. And uh, new scientific methods on sediment, such as uh, presented environmental DNA, they are opening up also new horizons, especially in regions where we have no bone material, as also in Galicia or Algarve, uh, yes. And this is so far uh, from me. Thank you very much.